Hi, Pastor Blair here, and I'm so glad that you've tuned in to use this resource, and we hope and pray that it's a blessing for you. We also pray that you would use this resource in conjunction with and participation in your local church. Discipleship was never meant to be done in isolation, and this resource was never meant to replace your participation and involvement in your local church. The local church is where we grow, and we grow as disciples of Jesus, and we see the forward progress of the gospel in our lives. Now, if this resource has been helpful for you, would you consider giving back to help us continue to make resources and continue to develop the quality of our resources? You can give financially at compassregina.com. And most importantly, we just treasure and covet your prayers. All right, so if you have your Bibles, we're in Judges chapter 6. So I want you to go there. And, and in the book of Judges, in this series, if you're kind of joining us this morning for the first time, whether online or, or here this morning, uh, we've been in this series. We took a, a brief pause to do a short Christmas series. The, the thing about the book of Judges, it's, it's a book of cycles. That's why the series is called Breaking the Cycle. And the cycle of the book of Judges is there's the, the nation of Israel rebels, uh, they repent, uh, at least uh, on the surface, there's renewal, and then they repeat. And you see this cycle seven times through the book of Judges. And we've been kind of taking our way through, and we're not going to go through every single verse in this book because it's a long book, but we are sort of camping out in specific areas that deal with this, this cycle of God's people relentlessly turning their back on him, and, and, and God, by his grace, relentlessly pursuing his people and bringing them back to himself and raising up people to help uh, defeat their enemies. So when we paused uh, before the Christmas break, the Christmas series, we paused at the beginning of Judges 6. And at the beginning of Judges 6, we were introduced to this man by the name of Gideon. All right, and, and, uh, and one of the things that we learned about Gideon is that God had, had called Gideon and, and, and raised him up so that he would defeat the, the uh, tyranny of the, of the Midianites. That were, uh, that were terrorizing the Israelites. And so God is trying to show his people in, in the beginning of chapter six, six that their problem is really not the Midianites. Their problem is, is, is themselves. They are the problem. Because so far in this book, up to chapter six, we've seen this cycle. And God is trying to show them that this, this veneer of repentance is not enough. Your problem is not out there. Your problem is in here. There's, there's something going on in you, your brokenness, and that's your problem. Your wayward hearts are being covered in the veneer of repentance, and it's not, it's, it's not right. It's, it's a problem. So if you recall, as we remembered and looked at the beginning of chapter 6, Gideon, uh, God, God raises this man, and, and God doesn't call the brave, he makes brave those he calls. Gideon was not a man who wanted to do this. He was a fearful man. Remember, he was, um, he was threshing wheat in the, the hole of a wine press. He was scared of his enemies. You see, when God calls us, he doesn't see us or define us by the condition we're in, but by what he's determined to make us into in Christ. So the first task that God calls Gideon to is that he is to go and destroy the altar of Baal and the Asherah. And, and the problem is for Gideon is that God calls him to this first task. And this first task is to tear down this idol. And it's his father's idol. So he has to go in the, he goes in the middle of the night with some people and they tear down this idol and they, uh, and they, they do it under the cover of darkness. And the next morning they discover that the, this idol has been torn down and this, uh, and, and, and Gideon's father, it's Gideon's father's idol, and somebody, somebody snaked on Gideon, and sure enough, they, they discover it was Gideon that did it, and they want to kill Gideon for doing this. So it shows you the power of this worship that they had for this idol, Baal. And, uh, and they, they try to, uh, they try to kill Gideon, and, uh, Gideon's father says, says to those people, remember, this is Gideon's father's idol that has been torn down. Gideon's father, trying to spare his son's life, says to these men that want to kill Gideon, he says, look, if Baal is so, such a powerful God as you say he is, then let Baal defend himself. If he's a God, Baal will defend himself. We don't have to do anything. And so it makes you question, right, the, uh, the father's uh, genuine 
uh, worship of this idol himself. So we're, we're not going to uh, look any deeper into that part, but I want to bring you to a place now of, of Judges 6, 36. So if you have your Bibles, Judges 6, 36, we're going to look from 36 to 40. And this is a, a maybe a familiar verse. When you think of Gideon, this this particular portion, um, you're going to, re- that's what you're going to think of. Because you think about the fleece, you think of Gideon, all right? If you've been, if you've been uh, in church world any length of time. So let's read this together, and then we'll unpack it, and we'll discover some things that we can learn from it this morning. The sign of the fleece. So Judges 6, 36. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry in all, uh, and it is dry in all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. So he's going to lay this thing on the ground, and he's saying to God, if you make this thing, this, this um, fleece, uh, if you soak that and everything else is dry, then I'll know, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to have some confirmation here. And it was so. And, when he, and he rose early next morning, and he squeezed the fleece. He wrung out enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. 39, then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please, let me test just once more with the fleece. So that wasn't enough. So he says to God, I know I know, I shouldn't be doing this, but just if you would just allow me to just to do, do something else, can, we just, can you just do something else for me? And he says, please let me just test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only and all, all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and all the ground, and on all the ground there was dew. So one test was the the fleece was soaking wet enough to wring out into a bowl of water, and the ground was dry. The next test was the ground was completely covered in dew, and the fleece was dry. So these are these two tests. Now you probably recognize that expression because maybe you've heard it, and maybe you've used it. You say, uh, you know, I'm putting out a fleece for God. Everyone, anyone ever heard that before? That, that saying? Yeah, sure. We've heard that. Uh, maybe you've put a, a fleece out uh, to determine God's will. Right? God, should I marry this person? And if I should marry this person, would, would you just allow them to tell me that they love me within the next two minutes? And if they do so, I will know that I should marry this person. Or maybe it's a job. Uh, the idea of putting out a fleece... This idea that, it, that, that is, is prevalent in our culture, whether you're in the church or outside the church, this idea of putting out a fleece is largely misunderstood and abused. So let's look at this more deeply this morning together. Now, when we use this idea of putting out our, a fleece in this kind of contemporary uh, usage, it's really different than what's happening here with Gideon. So today, we put out a fleece to determine God's will. Well, I'm thinking of buying a new car. I don't know whether I should or I shouldn't. Lord, if you send me $500 by tomorrow, that's a sign between you and me. And if you send that $500, I'll know it is your will for me to buy a new car. The expression of putting out a fleece uh, comes from this particular passage that we're looking at. And where, where Gideon requests God to, to guarantee uh, victory through these two tests. Putting, he's putting out the fleece. That's where we get that saying. So we have, you know, the fleece is wet and then the fleece is dry. So these, these two tests. Now let's look at some clarifying things about this passage. And then we're going to t- kind of take a, a, a little bit of a turn and look at a, a better way to, to uh, determine God's will for you than putting out a fleece. Okay? So the first thing we want to look at is this. Gideon wasn't asking God for a sign to determine God's will but a sign to confirm God's will. Verse 37, Then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. God has already called Gideon to something. Gideon knew what the will of God was, and he was asking God to confirm that in his life. He he already knew what God wanted for him. It reminds me of of years ago, before Sharon and I came to Regina, and uh, we were... uh, we were in a new home, uh, a home that I'd built, and we were only in the home for three months. And uh, we, 
we knew that God was calling us. Uh, we had left our church in Alberta because we knew that God was calling us to something else. And, uh, and through this time period of about a year, we, we, uh, we discovered, you know, that God was leading us to plant a church, which is a scary thing because you're like, what does that mean? Uh, never done that before. And so God is leading us to plant a church. We knew that it was, it was clear through, through different people. It was clear as we read scripture. It was clear as we, we prayed and we grew together. And even as we went to other churches to sort of, to, to see if, if this would be a good fit for us. Every time we went to another church, we said, it's a great church, but it's not a good fit for us. God's calling us to something else. And, um, and I can remember so vividly how clear it was that God was calling us to plant. But what was a little bit unclear was where God was calling us to plant. The question wasn't, what was God's will for us? We knew God's will was that we would plant a church. The bigger question is, God, do you want us to plant a church here, there? We'll go wherever you call us, wherever you make it known to us. We'll go wherever you want. Uh, we know what our task is. We know what the mission is. So, so you just make it clear where we need to go. And through a series of events and individuals, we knew that Regina was a possibility because um, through different, I won't get into all the different situations that we had and the different ways that God sort of confirmed that to us. But we were sitting in this brand new home and we were only in there for three months and we, we knew there was a lot at stake. And uh, so we just said, we, Sharon and I sat at our table and we just, we said, well, let's just pray. Let's just pray. And we prayed, God, would you just show us if Regina is the place to go, we will go. We know what your will is for us, but we just need to, some confirmation that Regina is where we need to go. And, if, and if, if we can have that confirmation, because our kids are little, oh, there's a lot of, that's a big change to move to another province. If we're not really 100% sure that this is what you want for us. And, and as we sat at that table, we prayed together, God, just, just show us, confirm this for us. We will go where you send us. We will go where you send us. We left it at that. Uh, about 15 minutes later, I get a phone call and I answer the phone and the person on the other end of the phone says, you, you, you know, hi Blair, you don't know who I am. Um, I've, I've heard uh, of you and the church you're in. I was doing my devotions this morning. God laid you on my heart. I called your church and got your number. Would you ever consider coming to Regina to plant a church? Okay, so we packed up and uh, we moved to Regina and, uh, and, and there was a lot of people that thought we were crazy. But, but for us, that was enough. Uh, God confirmed that for us uh, in, a, in what we understood as a pretty miraculous way. And, uh, and sure enough, here we are uh, all these years later. And so... There's different times in our lives where we come to God and we say, God, I know what your will is, uh, but I just, I'm not sure how to do it. I need a bit of confirmation. Can you just, can you just shed a little bit more light on that situation? So Gideon's fleece, friends, we need to understand was never to determine God's will for him. His fleece was to confirm God's will for him. He was, he was scared. He was unsure. His faith was weak, so he's asking God, God, can you just confirm for me? Can you just, can you just do this? I know this sounds crazy, but my faith is weak, and I, I don't really know, and I just want you to confirm for me. And that's what's going on here. So more often than not, when we put out a fleece, we wait for the writing on the wall to determine God's will. And when we do that, we're doing so in such a way that's very different than the way it was used in the Bible. We use it commonly today to determine a decision Gideon used it to confirm a decision and that's a big difference that's a big difference so no matter what conclusion you come to about the the modern practice of fleecing remember that originally it was used to confirm God's will not to determine it so Gideon received this double confirmation and he received that confirmation by the grace of God God didn't owe that to him but God gave him that and he ended up uh, fighting the Midianites and winning. Right, so that's the first thing we need to understand. It wasn't to determine God's will. It was to confirm God's will in Gideon's life. The second thing is this, and this is important for us. A fleece approach to life is dangerous. Okay, flee the fleece. Flee the fleece. Flee the fleece. Humble goals and loosely held plans are good. Expecting God to do tricks for us is bad. All right. 
Humble goals and loosely held plans are good. Expecting God to do tricks for us is bad. The whole fleece approach to life is dangerously close to violating Jesus' command, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. See, at this, at this point, it's, it's good for us to remember a, a really simple rule when it comes to biblical interpretation. All right? We don't get the truth from a descriptive passage. We get the truth from a prescriptive scripture, right? a prescriptive passage. So there's descriptive and there's prescriptive. The difference is this. A passage is descriptive if it's simply describing something that happened. While a passage is prescriptive if it's specifically teaching that something should happen. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That is prescriptive. It's a command. This is what you should not do. Okay, you remember earlier when we, when we were looking at this book, there was that, uh, that, that lady, Jael, and uh, Heber's wife. You remember that story? And it's from Judges 4. It was, this was this, uh, this nice homemaker who drove a tent peg through the head of Sisera. All right, do you remember right into the ground and, uh, and thankfully Bible clarified for us that he died? Um, well, this, this isn't telling us that we should drive a tent peg into the skull of our enemies. Right? This is a descriptive passage. It's not a prescriptive passage. It's not saying, look what she did and you should do this. We need to ask when we read the Bible if the passage is a description or if the passage is a command. Right? If the passage is, is the passage describing something, like the way it happened, or is it prescribing something, this is the way it should happen. Right? The difference is very important. And when a, a biblical passage is only describing something, but it's interpreted as prescribing, prescribing something, it can lead to really bad things and really bad biblical interpretation like driving a tent peg into the skull of your enemy. So we need to understand this. A fleece approach to life is dangerous because we need to understand the difference between what is prescriptive and descriptive. So a fleece approach to life is dangerous because fleecing comes dangerously close to attempting to manipulate God. The Bible repeatedly tells us uh, warnings against putting God to the test. So what's putting God to the test? Well, it's any attempt to sort of box him in in according to our standards. It's any, it's any human attempt uh, to say something like, Lord, if you're going to work, let me tell you exactly how you have to work in my life. God says, look, it, it doesn't work that way, right? I am God, you are not. I am the creator, you are the created. So this just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. So Gideon realized when he, that he was treading on dangerous ground when he said, you know, God, please don't be angry with me, but can I just ask you again to do another test for me? He knew he was, danger, he was on dangerous ground. And, and the, the fact that God would grant that request to him shows the graciousness of God even in his foolishness. So a fleece approach to life is dangerous also because the book of Judges, in the book of Judges, there's very little worth emulating in the book of Judges. So here's what I mean. There's, there are many great biblical books. The Bible presents many great godly examples for us to follow. The book of Judges generally does not provide a good example of much of anything. Have you noticed that so far? Israel and its leadership was in moral, spiritual, and civil decline. Judges shows just how far God's people have drifted away from him. And when the theme of the book is this, everyone did what was right in his own eyes, that tells you there's probably not a lot in here that we should be taking and going, yes, I need to be like that. We have to think twice. We have to use caution before copying whatever practices and attitudes we find in, in his chapter. So Gideon's request was probably more of an indication of his, of his cowardice and his unbelief, more than faithful, wise decision-making. So Judges isn't about emulating people in the book, but seeing the graciousness of God toward the people in the book. 
And so, of course, when we look at the book, there are certain people that have re- redeeming qualities or virtues that we can find. For example, you know, we, we already looked at Ehud's courage earlier in the book, or Deborah's worship, or us will see Samson's repentance. Nevertheless, the historical context of this book should make us very cautious with how we apply its stories and events to our lives. Right? And, and, and Gideon's fleece is no exception to that. So here we are, 2022. It's, it's hard to believe that it was, it was 22 years ago that, that Brad and, and Jennifer Aniston were together. Uh, I know that's what you were thinking about when 2022 rolled around. Uh, but it's hard to believe, you know, like I said, you know, Y2K, that was a big deal. I think we still have soup cans laying around our house uh, just in case from, from, from then. So we'll see. But let's, uh, let's just take a, a bit of a turn here and let's look at, because in 2022, like every year, we're going to all have decisions and choices that we're going to make. And the, and the question is, well, how do we make those things uh, in, in such a way that we, we are um, making decisions that align with God's will for our lives? It's, that's a big question we have. What's God, what's your will for my life? What, who should I marry? Where should I go to school? What job should I take? God, help me to understand your will for me. So let's look at this together, and I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 2. There's lots we can learn from Proverbs chapter 2, because I want you to see that that putting out a fleece is not the best way to determine God's will. In fact, it's probably one of the worst ways. We're going to look at what Scripture says is a better way for us to determine God's will. See, we need to be a people, friends, that are people that walk in wisdom. And wisdom is harder than finding information. There are a lot of really smart, smart people that are unwise. Okay? So don't equate head knowledge or intellect with wisdom. That's not the way the Bible describes wisdom. Of course, it's helpful. It's helpful. But that's not what wisdom is. It's not head knowledge. So wisdom and knowledge or wisdom and information are very, very different. So we need to be a people that walk in wisdom. So biblical wisdom means living a a prudent and disciplined life in the fear of the Lord. God doesn't expect us, uh, God doesn't expect us to sort of be, 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 uh, feeling our way around in the darkness, uh, in the darkness of trying to find his hidden will, like it's some kind of like Easter egg hunt. Uh, He expects us to trust him. And he expects us to be wise and to be a people that pursue wisdom. This is the theme of Proverbs 2. So let's look at some of these verses together. Proverbs 2, 1 to 6 says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commands with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and you raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, Okay, so let's just pause there. Did you notice in this passage, if you got your Bible there, you can see it up on the screen here. I want you to notice something. There's an an if-then construction to this chapter. Okay? If you do this, you get wisdom. If you accept my words, if you call out for insight, if you look for wisdom as for silver, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. And then you'll understand what is right, just, and fair. That's what verse 9 says. We'll come to it here. Let's continue on. Verse 5. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. Verse 10, for wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. So verses 5 to 11 show you everything that you get with wisdom. Right? You have understanding and knowledge and protection, and it's a, it's a good path to be on for your life. Just as important, having wisdom keeps you from real dangers. And if we continue to read this from, from 12 to 22, what we, will, what we won't do, but it says this, it shows that that when you have wisdom, it keeps you from, the, from, from wicked people. It keeps you from dark ways. It keeps you from crooked paths. It keeps you from the adulterous woman and her seductive speech 
and, of course, seductive men and their uh, seductive speech as well. Wisdom is the path of righteousness, while foolishness is the path of death. That's the thing that you see in the book of Proverbs. It's always, it's always looking at the way of wisdom and the way of foolishness. And it's always uh, holding the two side by side. This is the way of wisdom. Pursue that. Be this kind of people. And if you don't do that, then you're following the way of foolishness. And this is what happens when you follow the way of foolishness. Wisdom is knowing God and doing His commands. Foolishness, on the other hand, is turning from God and listening only, only to yourself. So when you, uh, when you talk about wisdom, we're talking about a profoundly God-centered approach to life. Seeking wisdom and putting out a fleece are two different things. Seeking wisdom means simply asking God for his direction for the next stop, for the next step in your life, uh, next decision that you might have to make, without boxing him in and telling him what to do. God, if you do this, then I will know. Putting out a fleece is, a, is an attempt to limit God in order to discover the future. And that's not good. Now, God will show you the next step. He is committed to showing you, the, he, he is not committed to showing you the future. You know what God's, uh, God's word says? It says that his word is a lamp unto your feet. It's not, it's not a light to light up the whole road so that you can see your future like some kind of crystal ball. God will lead you and it requires you to have faith and trust in the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God that you have seen when you reflect upon it over and over and over in your life. It also helps us to remember that wisdom involves looking at relevant circumstances. Saying something like, I won't buy that car unless I have $3,000 in the bank is not asking for a fleece, it's, a simply, it's simply a wise financial decision. It's just a wise decision. That's wisdom. Friends, this is what we need to understand. We are never told in Scripture to ask God to reveal the future or to show us His plan for our lives. That's a classic, God, what's your plan for my life? Like it's a mystery Easter egg hunt. But we're told in no uncertain terms to call out for insight and to cry aloud for understanding. In other words, God says, don't ask to see all the plans I've made for you. Ask me for wisdom so that you'll know how to live according to my book. Wisdom is precious because it keeps us from foolishness. So how do we get this, this valuable wisdom so that we can understand God's will for us as we encounter different decisions, big decisions that we need to make in our life? Proverbs 2 mentions three ways. Okay? We're going to look at this four steps. Okay, Typically don't do the step thing, but this is helpful this morning. Okay, Step one, when making decisions, search the scriptures and store up God's commands. Okay? So maybe you have a, a really big decision that you need to make. Should I marry this person? Should I take that job? Should I leave this job? Should I buy that house? Should I do this? Should I do that? All right. Filter those things through these four steps. Okay, This will help you to understand what God's will is for, the, for your decision. So, my son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, right? This is searching the scriptures and storing up God's commands. See, a problem with Gideon's uh, example of fleece setting is it doesn't take into account that, that our situation and his situation really are not uh, comparable, right? As, as Christians, we have two uh, powerful tools that Gideon lacked. Right? What do you think those tools were? Just shout it out. The Word of God and the indwelling of the Spirit. Okay? We know that in the Old Testament, not every, Christ, uh, every follower uh, of God had the indwelling of the Spirit. That came at Pentecost. We do know that in the Old Testament, God empowered and gave the power of His Spirit upon certain individuals for leadership. Gideon was one of those men that God clothed with his spirit, right? But it wasn't something that was available to everyone. So we have the word of God and the word of God we know is God breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We have the word of God. God has assured us that that his word is all we need to be thoroughly equipped for anything and everything in life. The, the, question, the question really comes down to this. Is, you know, as you're pursuing the will of God, if, if you're not going to open up His Word, 
uh, then do you have a right to even be asking, God, show me your will? If you're not going to be obedient to what God's called you to do and to open up his word and search the scriptures and to be, be, be in God's words so that you can know the mind and the heart of God and what he commands for us prescriptively and being able to differentiate what is descriptive. God's word tells us that we have everything that we need to be thoroughly equipped for anything and everything we have in life. We don't need this it's experimental, experimental proof, you know, signs and voices and miracles and to verify what He's already told us in His Word. Rather than seeking signs via fleeces, we should be content to know God's will for us in every situation every day. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16 Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Colossians 3.17. If these things characterize our lives, the decisions we make will be in, in accordance to God's will. He'll bless us immeasurably with His peace and His assurance. And there will be no need to put out fleeces and ask for, for God to, like, to do some signs and wonders, to be some kind of dancing monkey for us, to, to, to assure us that uh, he's in control of all things. So first step, seek God's word. Learn to love God's word. In 2022, uh, every one of us knows the first few chapters of Genesis really well. Because every year we say we're going to start a new plan, right? And we get through the first few chapters of Genesis, and then we kind of it dribbles away, and we kind of don't we don't continue on. Let me encourage you to try to press on in your reading of God's Word. Whatever plan you want to do, there are so many resources. And next week we'll we'll, we'll provide you a few different plans that you can do uh, that will be helpful for you. But be in God's Word. If you want to know God's heart and His mind, you have to be in His Word. All right, so the first step to discovering God's will for the tough decisions that you're going to encounter this year, be in God's word. Seek him in his word. Understand his commands for your life. Step two, listen to sound advice. Right, it's turning your ears to wisdom. Verse two, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. All right, listen to your friends, people that are close to you, people that know you. Right? The people that know you are the people that ought to be speaking into your life. The person on the internet that is not the person that should be speaking to you about your life. You don't know them, they don't know you. Right? Listen to your friends, your parents, your teachers, your leaders. Be teachable. Uh, parents, when you have kids, uh, just because you had them doesn't make you a great parent. Okay, It doesn't make you a great parent because you had a child. Right? It, it, it doesn't automatically make you equipped to know exactly what to do with your kids. But there are people that have gone before you, that have kids that are older, that have made mistakes, that have, that have you know, our family, Sharon, me, we have been so blessed by people in our family and people close to us who have always been that much further ahead with their kids that have spoken tremendous wisdom into our life. And it's been so helpful. So parents, humble yourself to know that you can't do it. You need help. You need people to speak into your life. Okay? And, and so, people at work, pe people that you know, have them speak sound advice. When you're wrestling with something, put it on someone. Ask someone, hey, I'm wrestling with this. What do you think? What are your thoughts on that? How do I wrestle through that? What do you, how, do you, how do I understand that through God's Word? Help me to understand. Give me wisdom. Allow people into your life. Don't be so prideful that you're unwilling to do that. So be in God's word. Secondly, listen to sound advice. The third step is call out for insight. It's prayer to God. Uh, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. Now, now the second one and the third one are almost interchangeable because, because when God gives us wisdom, He most often gives it through other people. And we need to be in prayer that we would be following, um, following God's will, not praying to try to figure out God's will, by testing him and throwing out these ridiculous fleeces. But, but, but turning to God and saying, God, help me to be in your will. Help me just to be 
following, show me, reveal. I'm not going to put some test out. I just know that you're good and I know that you're sovereign and just help me to make wise choices, bring the right people into my life. Help me, Lord, to make these choices in a way that brings you honor and glory. The fourth one is this. Make a decision. Oh, for heaven's sakes, make a decision. Okay? So many people I hear, oh, you know, it's like, I, I think of them as uh, Cousin Eddie on uh, Christmas vacation. You know, hasn't had a job in like seven years, and he's like, I'm holding out for management. It's like, oh, you know, so many people are like that when it comes to God. Oh, I, I'm just waiting for God's will. As if like some bird is going to drop it out of the sky, and it's going to land on your, in an Amazon box on your front doorstep. This, this is not the way it works. We, God, God wants us to be a people of wisdom, and eventually we need to make a decision. We need to need to make decisions. We need to make choices. And when you, when you use this idea of fleecing, it's an attempt to shift responsibility for our decisions from us to God, thus destroying the need for faith and responsible decision making. Too often we're trying to discover the future when God's will is not that we should know the future, but that we should only know the next step. The word of God is described, like I said, as a lamp unto our feet. We need to see it and understand it like that. All right, you still need to make decisions and choices. This idea, I'm waiting for God to write it on the wall for me, and you, you perpetually are in this state of never moving forward because you're so concerned that God's going to drop this magical Easter egg of His will into your lap one day, and then you're going to all, everything's going to be illuminated to you, and you're going to know exactly what to do. God gives us wisdom to make wise choices. He gives us His word as a guide to us. In, the, in those choices that we make. All the study, all the counsel, all the Bible studies, all the thinking, all the writing down, all the options, still the moment will come when you need to make a decision. God won't take the responsibility for you. And if you're going to take that new job, you've got to decide for yourself. If you're going to sell your house, you can't wait for God to write uh, a message in the clouds. You've got to sign the papers. God isn't going to do it for you. What, what is it? Just picture, friends. What do you have to do when you reach a fork in the road? You've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice. I mean, what good is it if you meet the, the fork in the road and, and all you do is you stand there and you, you hold out for management? You have to make a decision. So fleecing is an attempt to stand at the fork of the road forever without making a decision. It destroys our need for faith and decisive action. We look to Scripture, we listen to the counsel of others, we call out to God, and then we make a decision. We need to hear the, uh, as we end, I, I just want to hear the conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. If you're going to be anxious about one thing, and we all have levels of anxiousness as we look to the world sometimes, but if you're going to be anxious about one thing, be anxious about keeping his commandments. Be anxious about keeping his commandments. If you fear something, as we all do, fear God. Don't fear the future. Kevin DeYoung in his uh, book, Just Do Something, says this. I think it's great. He says, the will of God isn't a special direction here or a bit of secret knowledge there. God doesn't put us in a maze, turn out the lights and tell us, Get out and good luck. In one sense, we trust in the will of God as his sovereign plan for our future. In another sense, we obey the will of God as his good word for our lives. In no sense should we be scrambling around trying to turn to the right page in our personal choose-your-own-adventure novel. God's will for your life and my life is simpler, harder, and easier than that. It's simpler because there's no secrets we need to discover. It's harder because denying ourselves, living for others, and obeying God is more difficult than taking a new job or moving to Fargo. It's easier because, as Augustine said, God commands what he wills and grants what he commands. In other words, God gives his children the will to walk in his ways, not by revealing a series of next steps cloaked in shadows and mystery, but by giving us a heart to delight in his law. So the end is this. The end of the matter is this, friends. 
as we look to 2022, live for God. Obey the scriptures. Think of others before yourself. Be holy. Love Jesus. And as you do these things, do whatever else you like with whomever, whomever you like, wherever you'd like, and you'll be walking in the will of God. Okay? Okay? Got it? All right. Don't, don't overcomplicate it. Don't over-spiritualize it. Live for God. Obey the scriptures. Think of others before yourself. Be holy. Love Jesus. And if you can do that, you're walking in the will of God. All right, let me pray for us, and then we'll take communion. Father, thank you for this time, for this reminder of, Lord, how we so easily overcomplicate things and, and shroud things in mystery. God, it's, it's not complicated. It's not complicated. Live for God. Obey the scriptures. Think of others before ourselves. Be holy and love Jesus. And when we do that, Lord, we're walking in your will. So help us and empower us to do that, Lord, so that we might be in your will and that we might grow in this next year to love you more and, and to, to hunger after your word. And we thank you, Father, for this new year, that, that by your grace we are here to be in this new year because each day is a gift. And so we thank you for it. Praise things in your name. Amen.